In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to use lead code effectively. Lead code is arguably one of the most important skills for software engineers to learn. And some people go as far as to say that if you want to make more money in your career, then you just need to get better at lead code. But how do we actually use lead code effectively? This was the exact question that I set out to answer two years ago. And since then, I've passed over 30 technical interviews and gotten offers from some of the biggest names in tech. I'm now going to share my exact system for mastering lead code. And it all starts with knowing where to begin. There's a few different starting points you might think of when it comes to starting your lead code journey, but there's only one that you should really be going with. The first option you might think is lead code has their top 100 most like their most popular questions. So that might be a good place to start. And another one you may have heard of is this list called the blind 75, which is essentially a compilation of the 75 sort of most common interview questions that you'll get at a technical interview. While these are both great, there's another list that's called the neat code 150. And it's actually a superset of the blind 75 problems, but it is a bit more beginner friendly and has a broader range of problems and topics that it covers. All that to say, it's it's perfect for getting started. And if you're wondering why it's called the Neat Code 150, Neat Code is actually this other YouTuber in the tech scene where he kind of covers all of these popular algorithmic style problems and he gives you very nice solution walkthroughs for each one. And it's actually one of the powerful things about the Neat Code 150 list because not only has Neat Code created these video walkthroughs for all of the blind 75 problems, but he also has it for all of the Neat Code 150. In addition to video solutions, you also get his sort of code that he used to solve that problem written in Python. And it's honestly really nice to just sort of have this as a source of truth. The other really underrated improvement about this is that this works on both your technical coding abilities as well as your communication skills simultaneously. As you sort of progress and start doing some of your first technical interviews, you'll start to quickly understand that just being able to solve the problem is only a portion of the entire interview. In fact, a really big part of it is being able to communicate your solution to the interviewer and constantly be talking and putting the code that you're writing into organized structure and words that your interviewer will be able to understand. That's why the Neat Code videos are so helpful. The wording and the phrasing and how he approaches speaking about those problems are really good input to start feeding into your mind. Subconsciously, you'll just find yourself better at communicating these algorithm style solutions rather than someone who's just focused on getting a code complete solution on lead code. So now that you know exactly where you want to begin your journey, the next thing is to have a structured approach to how you're actually going to start. You want to tackle these lists of problems, both by difficulty and by topic. So let me explain what I mean. The first thing you want to do is you want to start by the easy problems on the neat code list, but you also want to do them in order by topic. So First, for example, if we have a pattern like two pointers, we want to do all of the easy problems that belong to the two pointers pattern before moving on to our next pattern, which is say sliding window. The reason you want to do this is because the most important muscle in this leak code game is building the pattern recognition and being able to group certain concepts together in your brain. As you start getting better at leak code, you'll quickly get to a point where any problem that you're shown, you already have just a few different buckets that you know you're going to place it into. And so now that you work through the easy problems and you've done them by topic, you should then move on to the medium problems. Medium problems are where you're going to start seeing similar levels of difficulty to what you might run into in an actual technical interview. And if you aren't familiar, LeetCode splits their problem to easy, medium, and hard. So those are the difficulties that I'm referencing. And if you're wondering why I don't tell you to go all the way up to hard, it's really because hard questions are very, very rare, and I've never really been asked one. And so when you're just getting started with using leak code, hards aren't really worth their time. So now that you understand that you want to approach these problems, both categorized by topic, but also done by difficulty, the next thing that you need to understand is that not all topics are made equal. There are three main categories that I would sort of personally assign to all of the topics that you'll see in the Neat Code 150 list. Category one includes 80% of the questions that you'll likely run into in any technical interview, which means that this is the highest ROI category and the one that you want to spend the most time perfecting. And that includes arrays and hashing, two pointers, sliding window, stacks, binary search, linked lists, trees, heaps, and graphs. After you understand all of the sort of patterns and problems up until medium for those topics, I'd suggest you move on to the next category. For this one, if I had to assign a number to it, I'd say maybe 15% of the interview problems you might run into will sort of fall into these category of topics. These include backtracking, 
1D dynamic programming, greedy algorithms, and interval-based problems. And finally, if you're really driving at home and want to be prepared for every type of problem out there, we have this final category, which sort of covers up, in my opinion, the sort of last 5% of problems. And that includes tries, advanced graphs, 2D dynamic programming, math and geometry, and bit manipulation. So to piece these two bits of advice together, I'd honestly recommend that you go through the easies by topic, focusing on the first 80% and then doing the mediums of that 80%, particularly if you're on a time crunch, and then you can sort of allocate the amount of time you have accordingly based on this information. The next thing that's really important for me to call out to you is time management and how to approach solutions. It's really important for you to limit the time you spend on every single question and I'm pretty aggressive with it where I would want you spending no more than 10 to maybe at the most 15 minutes per problem that you're trying to solve. And when I say that, I don't mean if you already have an idea at a solution, then you shouldn't keep going down that sort of train of thought if it seems like it's working, but you shouldn't be sitting there and really hitting a mental roadblock for longer than 10 minutes. There are two reasons for this. First, it doesn't take very long to know if you know how to solve a problem or not. And leak code problems really are about knowing how to solve them. It doesn't have to be overly complicated where you need to sit there and grind it out for an hour straight to prove to yourself that you might be able to figure out how to solve that problem. That's not what this is about and you need to drop that mindset immediately. The next reason you don't wanna do this is you don't want to fall into a trap of starting to learn a ton of anti-patterns. What I mean by anti-patterns is if you've gone really deep on solving a specific problem in an incorrect way and you've kept trying to go down that path, once you even have learned the solution, your thoughts are a little fuzzy around it. Next time you see this come up in an interview, you might really remember that time that you were sort of going down this incorrect path and you might not be able to clearly differentiate if that was the correct one, if that was the incorrect one, and you really make it more difficult on your mind to remember how to crack each of these problems. Solutions are the thing that's going to teach you a lot. Similar to when you're in a classroom environment, you first get the lesson plan and then you get the homework. In this case, we're starting with the homework, but you should quickly reference the textbook, which are the solutions, in order to be able to solve those problems. It's unreasonable for you to think that you're already going to know how to solve the problems. And do not think negatively of giving in to the solution. The solution is your friend. And now as you're watching these solutions, try to focus on recognizing the patterns and the train of thought. Start recognizing the patterns that are used to solve this problem and maybe what other problems you've seen a similar pattern in. And also, I just kind of want to call out that going down this list of really trying to fatigue yourself on each individual problem also kind of progresses you much slower. If but you know how to code, then you know the mental fatigue that comes along with really pushing your mind to do a coding task. And so if you're sitting there and you're spending one hour on every single lead code problem, you only probably have one or two problems that you don't know in you before you're pretty burnt out mentally. But on the flip side, if you only spend 10 to 15 minutes per problem, then the weight of doing your next lead code problem doesn't feel like such a heavy push. So while you don't have to over index on this earlier on when you're just getting started, if you want to start using lead code effectively, then you need to start optimizing for pattern recognition. A few quick examples off the top of my head is anytime I hear something like top K elements, I instantly think of a heap. Anytime I sort of have a sorted array where I'm going to be searching for a certain element inside of it, binary search is just popping up at front of my mind. Or let's say you have something that's like the maximum contiguous string or subarray, then you likely are looking at some kind of sliding window problem. So try to understand the essence of each solution and you'll quickly see that there's only really like 10 to 12 patterns out there to begin with that sort of apply to all of the lead code easy and medium problems. Finally, I want to talk about the importance of tracking, revisiting, and reflecting. One of the things that really helped me ramp up on LeetCode quickly was documenting everything that I was doing, which means starting with recording every single problem that I solved. I have a Notion template for tracking all of my LeetCode problems, which I'll gladly link in the description below so you can go and duplicate it for yourself. But for now, I'll walk you through how I actually use it. For every problem, I include some metadata, like sort of what kind of data structures or patterns that I use. But the really important thing that you want to index on here is the revisited category, as well as the confidence level. And another thing is like inside the card of each 
problem, you can store some information about the solution that stood out to you that you can revisit later. So that's also helpful. The revisited marker exists because you want to revisit all of the problems that you've solved. And that's how you're really going to build the confidence of being able to replicate this in a coding interview. You especially want to do these for the ones that you're unsure about. And you want to aim for a higher confidence level upon revisiting the problem than you originally had. So when I solve a problem, if I felt like I really know how to solve this problem and I got this in an interview and I would be able to solve Solve it, then I'll put a pretty high confidence rating. But on the flip side, if I didn't really know how to solve this problem and I was struggling, I would say that this is low confidence and that I want to revisit this problem for certain. And then I would employ this concept that I sort of refer to as like my mental RAM of unvisited problems. And this kind of just refers to this concept of like, how many problems do I allow myself to start learning? How many new problems before I start to revisit the ones previously and build up the confidence scale of them? Essentially, I never want to go too long with having a way too big stack of problems that need revisiting. And the other reason that this entire concept of tracking is really helpful is that once interview time comes around, you have a really organized structure of which problems you know, which problems you sort of need to revisit or aren't very confident about. And it kind of organizes that entire structure for you instead of feeling like I've done a few leak code problems. I don't remember what I know. I don't remember what I don't know. And you sort of feeling lost otherwise. I assure you that this kind of mental RAM approach done systematically will dramatically increase your rate of learning for LeetCode. And as you're starting to prepare for some of these technical interviews, if you also want to get some insight into what the rest of the software engineering interview process looks like, then I recommend you check out this video where I give a complete walkthrough of the entire interviewing process. I'll see you in the next one.